Welcome to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about American elections, the American elections happening right now, and how they appear on the world stage. The final stretch for the U.S., that's a double entendre. Our guest for this important show is Rupmati Kandakar, our geopolitical strategist. Hello, Ajay. Thank you for having me on your show. It's always my pleasure. Well, here we are in the middle of election day, and um, I want to ask you, you know, how it looks in terms of, mm, call it the, the 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 rule of law, the rule of law, and the peaceful transfer of power in the United States. Um, we're famous. We're the um, you know the model, the city on the hill uh, for mm, law and order and peaceful transfer of power and democracy. Democracy is representative government. How are we doing today, Rupmati? Jay, we are we are we are torn between these two candidates, uh, Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, Republican and Democrat. And Jay, it's the biggest election on the planet. Can't uh, say it less. Can't say it more. And it's the most important election ever in any type of politics. So we are keeping a very very the world is keeping a very close eye on this. And uh, in a few hours, Jay, we will know who who sits in. Uh, on the president's seat. But before that, you know, you have uh, uh, these two candidates, Jay, who have such a, uh, a resume behind them that we have to really look look and analyze what they will bring towards the politics of America, Jay. And uh, that's where we have to go into an in-depth analysis so that we can have a glimpse into their tenure and a glimpse into America's progress and prowess, Jay. So let's go for it, Jay. There's all kinds of bizarre things happening Aside from Trump's 120 lawsuits, uh, which claim yeah. there was fraud in the election, there is fraud in the election, which he which he filed or caused to be filed before the election ever started. I thought that was kind of interesting. Fraud before the fraud, so to speak. You know. Now the, the militias are are organizing. They're being organized nationally by by uh, by Trump and the MAGAs and the and the GOP uh, with weapons and the like. And, it's a great concern that the um, the polling places may not be safe. You have assurances from the governments in various states um, that they will be safe, that the police, um, uh, whatever law enforcement officials are around, will make sure they're safe. But that's that's not entirely clear. Uh, and you have, um, and this goes to the global issue, you have Russia, at least Russia, and Iran sending propaganda in by way of um, proxy actors, by way of uh, social media, trying to affect the election. You know, I, I find it extraordinary. I, I know this happened to some limited degree in 2016 and 2020, but it's apparently happening wholesale now. And although mm. the government warns us that it's happening, the FBI warns us that it's happening, I'm not sure they can do anything about it. So, you know, if I'm a bystander looking at it from across the pond, I'm really, I'm really wondering what we got here. Is this a an orderly proceeding? Is this an orderly election? Election that that you can count on, that will be reliable, um, that you can have confidence in. What do you think the Europeans think about our domestic troubles, and who do you think they are rooting for? Jay, um, now this is Trump taking his uh, re-election after a defeat. It's happened in 131 years, after 131 years. And Kamala Harris has got a record of being the vice president for four years. So we have quite qualified candidates at the helm, but no voice from Europe. So this is the point that uh, Europe has, Jay, that they have, they are literally, they don't have a stand in uh, any kind of uh, situation or issue. And they always uh, give a blurry um, um, perspective on any global um, happening, Jay, currently. So that's where Europe is falling short of being in the midst of uh, international politics, Jay. And it's the same with the uh, US elections. You don't see countries taking sides. You don't see, uh, you know, you don't see endorsements. You don't see, you just have these rogue countries which will come and, like you mentioned, I Iran and Russia trying to play uh, um, havoc makers. And you know how sensitive this election is is we have seven swing states apart from the traditional Democrat and Republican states. We have Nevada, Arizona, North Carolina, Georgia, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. So 
these states can decide who wins. So, uh, Jay, when you have swinging the vote in these states, it will be such a dangerous uh, swing. And you know that Kamala Harris is working with an anti-incumbency factor also. So it's all the more difficult for her more than Trump. Trump is a showman and he will come, you know, uh, disguised with his uh, fanfare. But for uh, Kamala Harris, everything has been a continuity. And if you have gotten tired of Joe Biden's policies and uh, issues, she has to carry the extra luggage and present herself again. So that's a difficult task and you have to give it to her to try to uh, uh, woo the voters. And today we are seeing both the sides actually telling people to go out and vote and voting um, by far is, it can't be underestimated, is the pillar of democracy. Unless you go and exercise your vote, it's not going to be registered and democracy doesn't work without a vote. So you'll have so many lazy people th taking it as a holiday. Uh, too lazy to go to the polling booth, making excuses to go to the polling booth. That's not how a democracy works. So go out there and vote for your favorite candidate. It has to be the uh, slogan for every household, every person. That's what makes a successful democracy, whoever is the winner, Jay. But you have to have this, uh, what is a culture of democracy thriving in your country. Uh, country. And we know if um, Donald Trump comes into power, this kind of free will uh, <laughs> will get uh, jingoist, jingoistic uh, um, color to it. And, you know, you'll have, uh, like you said, what will we having? be having the civil war <laughs> uh, again? You know, there'll be chaos and, uh, um, what do you say, um, oppression. Or, you know, they don't want you to express your opinion. They want to suppress your opinion. That is how uh, the wild side is working right now. So, uh, Jay, you have to be bold enough to cast your vote. Whatever happens on the streets, what it has to, you know, not affect how you translate it in the voting booth. That is so important, Jay. Always underestimate it. And that's how some elections in Europe, like these migrant, uh, um, where the migration is has gone beyond the limit, the migrants are keen to vote. They're keen to exercise their vote. The leaders who are in elections tend to woo the migrants more than the domestic civilians. And that's where it gets, um, the the results get swung into their favor. I, I always give this example of Sadiq as the mayor of London. The original domestic uh, Britishers were taking it as a holiday, but the migrants have gotten up and voted and he's got elected for a historic third term. So that is where, you know, one of the reasons why uh, every civilian has to take it as a responsibility and a duty to vote. When you look at the uh, the voter, especially the, the Trump voter in this country, um, you find that uh, that voter is more, more than likely just part of a cult. Um, mm. And it's, it's a vote on personality. It's a vote on insulting the other side. Um, you know, uh, junior high school schoolyard insults on the other side, you know, insulting the other side, calling names and whatnot. But it's not looking at the future. It's not looking at the, the stakes, what will happen, what will happen in terms of the oppression, the loss of democracy on this side, but also, you know, the, the global um, the global power of the United States, the hegemonic power of the United States. He doesn't think of that. The Trump voter doesn't think of that. On the other hand, and this is going to be my question here, if I go to Europe and I talk to the average voter, as you said, countries in Western Europe do not take positions um, and endorse one candidate or another. They don't do that. <clears throat> Frankly, I would have appreciated if they had done that because their interest is involved. But let's talk about the average person, the average informed voter in Europe. Does that voter understand the stakes? Does that voter understand that this could be the end of, if Trump is elected, this will be the end of NATO, um, that there will be tremendous damage to Europe, to the EU, um, and that uh, Trump will uh, enhance the power of Russia and Iran for that matter? Um, although he makes argument to the contrary, uh, you know he's going to take steps that will be against the diplomatic interest and global interest of the United States. Does the voter or the citizen in Europe understand the stakes any better than the Trump voter here? 
Jay, uh, European citizens are basically, I would largely categorize it as ignorant about this because you see they are under the security blanket or umbrella of the United States under NATO. And when you, you, you say that under Trump, it would be uh, under threat, NATO as a whole. So uh, security of uh, Europe is going to go for a toss any which way. And Jay, um, to understand that, you know, you have to have uh, support of funding, you have to have support of the right candidate who will not do that. And that has not come forth. Uh, you see, they don't, they think that whoever comes will come and blindly support uh, Europe and it's gone into spineless politics uh, in Europe. Nor do they take a stand on the domestic issues, nor do they take a stand on international issues. So EU is like, uh, you see, a formality parliament that is happening. It was, it was supposed to be discussed or uh, um, uh, come into existence as a united voice of Europe. And it's not happened. They have internal domestic issues, uh, small, small states, so small that they don't matter also. So, Jay, to bring the magnanimity of the um, US elections onto the European stage right now is a, a total, um, it's not matching. It's, uh, it's a mismatch totally because... Um, European politics itself is right now hologic. Do they understand that their future is directly related oh. to the, the result in this election? That's what I'm telling you. The, the countries don't understand it. How can we expect the domestic population to understand this? They are so engrossed in their domestic uh, entanglements of issues like migration, of issues like economics. There you have a, the you have the Ukraine Russia conflict right at their doorstep. They are not bothered about this election, but this election is going to make a difference within the borders of Europe. That is the irony of the whole thing. Jay. They should yeah. consider and uh, keep it in mind. A number of my friends have gone to Europe recently. A number of them gone to uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Uh, it's, it's an interesting place to visit, to go as tourists. And they come back with one message. They say that the younger generation in those countries is very excited about democracy. They're, they're very happy not to be under, you know, the oppression of Russia. Um, and um, they, they, uh, they are very optimistic about the future. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure that optimism is justified. Here's my question. If democracy fails, and if Trump wins, it will fail in this country. How will the people in Europe feel about their optimism over democracy? How will those young kids uh, in Eastern Europe feel about the ultimate uh, success of democracy in their countries? Will they still be optimistic? Jay, democracy is uh, uh, has to be a it's a practice. It can't be ingrained. It has to be continuously practiced. And you know, uh, when you have a wrong leader at the helm. It's going to change things, and uh, when uh, you you you've seen it, how fast politically things implode, and they can go from uh, on the global scale from globalization to complete close down of borders. So it can happen uh, in a nation uh, without a doubt. The constitution can be what do you say? There can be amendments which will be uh, not conducive to democracy in the future. And you have, like you said, the Eastern uh, European states who look. To, to uh, upwards at uh, the U.S. as a uh, beacon of democracy and as, you know, to set it as an example. So that failing will, of course, set uh, a wrong example. And these countries are in the infancy of democracy, so they don't really know where to go. And if at this stage they fail, they go back to authoritarianism. They go back to being closed societies. And that will not work, Jay, because the more democracies we have, the better for no conflict zones in the world that we have seen. You know, people have amnesia. And mm -hmm. if you take, um, say, three or four generations or more, um, you can expect the, the current generation to not know what happened before. And um, clearly, uh, there are people uh, in my world anyway, who draw very stark parallels between what Trump is doing and promising um, to Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf. Do you think the people in Europe make the same, draw the same parallels, or have they forgotten what it's like to be under a dictatorship of that kind, a dictatorship that will 
you know, be total suppression where children can't talk to their parents and parents can't talk to their children, where nobody can express himself for fear of being turned in. Um, do you think they understand? Do you think they draw the parallel to what happened in the 30s? They underestimate that history repeats itself. And uh, that's why uh, we are going to have somewhat of a, um, a person who has no hurdles or no barriers to his power. His power lies in his head. Jay. And uh, Trump visualizes his power before he gets it. He has already spoken of what he will do. And that is where, you know, you can get glimpses of Hitler in his voice or his uh, uh, manifesto, like you say. He declares and he uh, expresses everything with a love for his country. He camouflages his, uh, it with the American flag. So whatever he's saying is camouflaged with patriotism. And that's where it blinds uh, civilians. Really, I'm telling you, they, do, they have a knack of doing this. How many times you have seen Kamala Harris <laughs> hugging the American flag, but you could see him fist bumping into the air and, you know, you have this uh, patriotic uh, survival instinct coming out. So this is, uh, Jay, a portrayal of a self that comes with experience. And he is uh, very, very smart at doing this. And uh, that is coming across in this election more for us, as, you know, we see as observers, we are seeing it. Uh, that this is more of a showmanship that is coming up. And like I told you, Kamala Harris is carrying the burden of Biden policy. She doesn't have uh, her own policies right now to spell out because she's been in power for four years. So she has to come up with innovative ways and it's a constant, uh, more aggressive struggle than Trump. While we think it must be easier for Kamala Harris, but it's not. It's really not. You know, uh, in this country, we're pretty sure that our younger generation, in fact, most of our generations, don't understand what happened during World War II. Um, mm. They don't understand history. They don't understand what could happen if history repeated itself. And as you and I know, <clears throat> history does repeat itself. In any event, I'm wondering whether uh, the younger generation in Europe is equally um, un uninformed about what happened in Europe, uh, what happens in autocratic countries and dictatorships, or have they likewise, you know, been been spared the knowledge? Are they likewise ignorant about what could happen, either here or there, under a dictatorship? Because that really was an awful time. But do they understand it could happen again? Do you think their education is complete? Jay, see, the third generation, like you said, in Europe is enjoying the fruits of the previous struggling generation. After the World War, they were constructive generation. They build Europe to be as it is right now. This generation is facing uh, a stress and, you know, a tension of uh, who is coming to destroy our economy. Why is our economy getting destroyed? What is happening? Pandemic happening. You know, they are more impatient. And for them, like you said, uh, they have a short-term memory. They want to just know what is and what now. Uh, they don't know what has happened before and uh, what, you know, what has led to this point. So uh, the younger generation, Jay, uh, they don't have really this right and left swing. Jay. They are very neutral and they act in the spur of the moment. And that is what is dangerous. What happened uh, in the when Israel was attacked uh, by terrorists, uh, the Hamas, you had these university students, people getting uh, into a parade or, or walk uh, through the streets for Palestine without knowing what is the history of Israel, what has happened over there. So that kind of fervor that comes in and they just swing through it without thinking. That's the same thing that is happening with almost every election. day. They don't understand the technicalities of elections with what is the inclinations, what is the ideology, what is the political discourse that happens. And uh, like we said, uh, the the American young voters, there's a swing towards uh, Trump. Why? Because of this kind of movie maniac uh, uh, portrayal that he has. So uh, see that it's, he's playing to the gallery, Jay. Oh yes. So one of the one of the you know Rachel Maddow on Monday had a really yeah. really interesting report, and one of the things she said is that Putin. Um, by virtue of his relations um, with um, uh, 
Iran and China is, is leading an anti-American bloc. Okay, all right, we kind of know that. Um, and she also said that if Trump wins, and this really s struck me, if Trump wins, the United States would join that bloc. It would side with Putin as the leader of that bloc. And if the United States joins that bloc, it would be the end of American hegemony. And um, I wonder what your thoughts are, because uh, he could do that. If he does that, I'm not saying he absolutely will, but if Rachel Maddow is right and we join the Putin bloc, what happens? Can you project into the future on that possibility? Yeah, Jesse, his uh, Trump's slogan was that he will uh, he never had a war in his tenure and uh, he will never have any war in his tenure. So uh, on the first day when he signs the mass deportations of immigrants, the second day would be dedicated to this kind of uh, coming back with Putin and the camaraderie with Putin. And that is very dangerous because Jay, Putin is so uh, friendly towards Trump and he, he calls, uh, you know, it's like his buddy. Uh, so we don't see that uh, competition. We see that there is going to be just, you end the war with Ukraine, we'll stop supplying uh, uh, weapons to Ukraine. That is his solution. One, one sentence, one line without thinking. And uh, nothing happens after that. Ukraine is gone. Ukraine is finished. So uh, repercussions of uh, Trump's coming into power are so many, but so belittled by uh, what we, uh, what the perceptions are. We, like you said, you have not been able. There's going to be an anti-American bloc that Putin is forming. He will come as a leader. That is so. Uh, that is hypocrisy. <laughs> so we don't know what is going to happen if uh, you know, Trump and Putin unite on the global stage. NATO gone, uh, climate change oh, yeah. got cut across completely. You remember when Trump had come in, climate change funding had just vanished. UN funding vanished. So he, he is very clear on this. He just wants, and he wants to set up tariff regimes with uh, countries who have been supplying to uh, America. He wants to increase the import duties and decrease the export duties. So that would bring in more U.S. trade. But does it really happen in real? Uh, J There's going to be so many technicalities before you do this. Saying it on the political stage is very easy, and he knows that. Saying it, promising better homes, promising better salaries, this is all um, political jargon that he's uh, mastered, Jay. And you have so many issues where he's wrong, the abortion rights, the immigration, everything. He doesn't speak that. One of the organizations that he has been attacking from the beginning of his first administration um, has been the United Nations. And I can understand mm -hmm. that. The United Nations uh, has become mm, defunct. defunct. Um, but there are 192 members of the United Nations, and they're from all over the world. And they do have, you know, what do you want to call it, a forum, at least. Uh, it brings them together. I I assume that uh, that Putin and Xi Jinping are working hard to take control of Security Council and and the General Assembly. However, I'm I'm wondering your thoughts about what happens to the United Nations if Trump is elected and doesn't make any contribution financially, attacks them, undermines them. What happens if the United Nations in a in a Trump presidency just presidency just disappears. What effect? The uh, U.S. is the biggest uh, uh, contributor to the budget of the United Nations. And when Trump came in, he immediately reduced it. He reduced the budget. And uh, Jay, it was because, you know, he didn't like this when the American delegates came into the uh, house, uh, any, any uh, conference hall, the Israeli uh, delegates came, they used to be booing by uh, the majority um, other delegates of other nations. So he didn't take to it nicely and immediately he cut off the funding. So for him, it was just that I uh, this is in my power, I will do it. And he has treated uh, the UN just as a, a forum where you discuss things. He didn't take it as a, a forum which he could use to uh, implement things. So uh, like we had during the responsibility to protect in Libya, how the UN was used as um, you know, a forum for collective uh, 
coming together of nations and getting into Libya and freeing it out. So that kind, he never used, he never thought on those terms. If he was really serious about it, Jay, let's take a hypothetical situation, he would have used the UN for, he would have said that he uses the UN forum to come in together collectively and end the war in U Ukraine and Russia and to protect Israel. He can use this as a legitimate uh, forum, but he doesn't want to do that. So he's very clear about it and he ignores it completely. You know, the other linkage I want to ask you about is we know what he would do with them. You know, terminate funding, he would attack them. He would do everything he could to dismember them and to, to terminate them. And Putin would be so happy about that because Putin is terrified of NATO and anything that NATO does, any member that NATO takes. And that would be very damaging in Western Europe. But the parallel NATO is the itself, which is, you know, an extension, a, 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 an evolution of the common market. It's mostly a trade organization. It's economic. And it has done a lot for Europe. Um, it hasn't solved all the problems, but it has been, again, a forum, a, a trade, a trade organization. But if you knock off NATO, uh, mm -hmm. and if you attack Europe in general and anything that binds them together, which is what Trump will do, um, then you have an effect, uh, sort of a, a secondary effect against the EU. Do you think the EU? Uh, will be affected by Trump's termination of NATO? For sure, Jay. They use NATO as a security umbrella. They use NATO as, uh, 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 you know, securing their borders. Without NATO, Europe is uh, boundaryless, borderless, and uh, uh, without any kind of a blanket, security blanket. So for them, NATO matters across the Pacific. And uh, you remember uh, what it is in uh, Samuel Huntington's uh, theory also, that U.S. has to promote its relations with the European Union, the Western European Union. So uh, that kind of a natural ally bonding that has to happen, that is, uh, uh, you know, it's one way traffic from the U.S. going to Europe. That is the problem, Jay. There is no reciprocal effort from Europe, and that's where we need to bring that out from Europe. And it's very necessary in uh, international politics that you have a give and take. If it's only give, give, it's not beneficial for uh, the hegemon or for a small country. So as the hegemon, you have to make sure that you also get what you want. Suppose you're giving such a big security blanket. You have to have those equitable trade policies from Europe, which will allow American exports to reach European shores. Are we doing that? We are not doing that. And that disequilibrium hurts the American economy more than one can think, Jay. In return for the security blanket, you have to have more access to uh, European markets. You have to have more access to their um, uh, decision making, or you know you have to have them as a coalition in on these international forums where they vote for your policies. You don't have them booing uh, American policies. So every small bit matters when you're giving so much. You have to have something in return. You can't be selfless on the international stage. I'd like to talk about the Logan Act for a minute, uh, the, one, the one that prohibits um, uh, non-state actors, uh, non-government representatives uh, from uh, engaging with foreign powers. Uh, it's, it's actually a criminal act. So if you do that, you're, you're guilty of a felony. Um, in any event, both Trump and Musk have been having multiple secret conversations with Vladimir Putin. That's clear. It's in the paper. They admit it. They're not going to tell us what the conversations are about. Um, they're secret. Both of those guys are non-state actors, and they're presumably talking about um, diplomatic issues, not, not uh, you know dessert recipes, uh, with Vladimir Putin. So um, your thoughts about that? It, it seems to me that, you know, if I were the president or put it this way, if you were the secretary of state, which I always want you to be, um, you would say something about this. You can't do that, boys. You're not permitted. You're restricted, prohibited from doing that under the Logan Act. Um, what What's your take on this? And um, what can be done about it? Because it doesn't bode well for the United States to have multiple contacts with a foreign power. 
Jay, Elon Musk, with a contribution of $119 million to the Trump campaign, has got himself promised a position in his portfolio as the secretary of cost cutting. So, uh, you know, it is bribery at its best, open completely. And you have now Elon Musk uh, with uh, Trump at his uh, resort. They are going to watch the elections together. Everything is so pre-planned, getting him into uh, the uh, official secrets. Everything is going to be open for him. And you have, uh, you know, a total breach of uh, information and national security. And this is going to be transferred to his best friend, uh, Putin. So it's a, a troika at the helm that we have. And so this is dangerous for American security and American politics, Jay, because uh, not only does it give a breach, uh, secrecy is very important in international politics. We know that. And this will give so much access, Jay. It's like selling your... Uh, we used to have spies <laughs> earlier. I think this is open spies. Nothing to hide. Everything is being... Uh, transferred openly, you know who is his friend, you know who is his friend, who's going to meet whom. Everything we know, and it's happening in front of our eyes. And the point is, the majority is not taking objection. And democracy works in the will of the majority. So we have ignorance at this level, Jay, who are not looking at how these secrets will be show, sold to Russia or Russian hands will have access to uh, so many documents and so much information is going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be regressive for American uh, future politics. So this reaching, like you have spoken in the beginning of the show, this ignorance uh, is dangerous for us. Well, dangerous, um, you know, really turns into dangerous in time of contention, of war. Um, you know, uh, Musk, uh, Rachel Maddow called Musk the CEO of Trump's campaign. And I guess that's accurate. Is he's actually running it. But at the same time, he has his uh, uh, SpaceX. He sends uh, satellites into orbit. He's got hundreds of them up there, uh, 600 plus, as I recall. And he's got mm -hmm. Starlink. And the shockeroo of two or three years ago was when he terminated the uh, Starlink, cover Starlink coverage for Ukraine, uh, which uh, made it impossible for them to attack uh, Russian ships in the Black Sea. Um, and that, that may have been at the request of, of uh, Vladimir Putin. Right now, Starlink is turned on. Musk turned it on to help Russia. So he's, he's providing this very critical, um, strategical weapon, if you will, to Russia. Um, but not Ukraine. At the same time, at the request of uh, Xi Jinping, he wanted a favor, a favor from Elon Musk. So he asked Musk to um, cut Starlink off from Taiwan. Um, so Xi Jinping apparently has access to Musk, and Musk did that. So Musk is operating um, as a strategic character with regard to a technology and a system uh, built largely with American support uh, <clears throat> for the benefit of our enemies. Your thoughts? Yeah, Jay, uh, like I told you, double agent, spy, all these words are now falling into uh, history. They're not, we are having, it's just Elon Musk, Elon Musk everywhere. He's moving around so fast and so swiftly and with such sensitive uh, uh, technology, Jay. It could have been kept uh, confined to uh, American hands and, you know, uh, not played uh, around like this. Jay. Whoever asks, give it to them. And uh, because Twitter blocked uh, Trump's account, buy out Twitter, make it X and let Trump use it at his will. So all these kind of uh, tactics are just, they are, uh, they're just using, misusing their money, monetary power uh, at, political levels. And so, Jay, this kind of, like you said, he's being named almost the official CEO of uh, uh, the Trump campaign. So you see his campaign is not just political, it's more economics, because uh, when you pump in money, you're also buying out voters, you are also uh, bribing the voters to uh, come in. And when you see Elon, Elon Musk on the uh, Trump campaign, the young uh, young uh, voters 
who don't know what Trump is doing in China or Taiwan will see him as, you know, going into space, wanting to go into Mars and look upward to him. And when they see him endorsing Trump, they will fall into the wrong space. So misinformation in this, this your US election has been at such a uh, high level, Jay. It's uh, insane because the right information has not reached the majority population. That's my take on uh, this election, Jay. It's just been superficial nope. information coming up. If I were um, a European ally in the government or on the street following the news, and by the way, I think we, we have to assume that they get all the news that comes out of the U.S. You know, it's, it, it's remarkable. You could talk to somebody anywhere in the world, including a developing country, and they get American news. They know what's going on just as well, theoretically, just as well as, as we do. And mm -hmm. so when, when they realize that um, Trump has said he's going to essentially uh, destroy NATO, destroy the Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. and have a, a huge and negative effect on, on Europe, they should be very, very concerned whether they make public statements about it or not. And then, of course, you have all these strange events at the polling places. Um, and, the, and the net effect of that is that um, um, the reliability uh, of, of, the, of the election process is in, great, is in great question here in this country. And it must be also in great question among our European allies, whether you can count on a fair, free and fair election. And finally, before I finish asking my question, um, I'm very troubled, and they must be very troubled, with Trump's um, secret deal with Mike Johnson, because they know, just as we do, that the House of Representatives could turn over the election. And I suspect that the secret deal that Trump has entered into with Mike Johnson is to do just that. So if I'm in Europe and I see this, it's, it's, it goes to the writer in the Irish Times, who a couple of years ago said, my feelings about the U.S. is 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 pity. I pity the U.S. And I wonder, you know, how people from all of this feel in Europe about the future of the U.S. because it affects them. I wonder how they feel. You know, I mean, I have trepidation. Uh, everyone I know has trepidation about how today is going to work out and who's going to be in the Oval Office next time we, we look and whether that would be respected as a peaceful transfer of power and so forth. Um, how do they feel? How should they feel? How do they feel about the reliability of this country? Jay, uh, to bring this out into... Uh, Trump is using all his business acumen to try to have a you know, comprehensive takeover so he's using uh, economic uh, power. He's using his uh, might in, you know, he's, uh, he's threatening with the MAGA force uh, if the elections are not in his favor, while he gives a statement that, you know, he would accept defeat if it was a fair election. So if it terms as, as unfair, you will have riots all over. So this kind of uh, scenario that he brings in, whether he, uh, whether he want it or not, he wants to uh, promise victory to himself. So this kind of, uh, portrayal of his campaign, Jay, has got a very different uh, um, absorption by the um, European voters or uh, European uh, population because uh, to see democracy working out like this is very different for them. For them, they have these right wings, uh, left wing, then coalitions, then you have, uh, you know, these swing uh, states, uh, swing uh, parties who will maybe think about, you know, supporting or not. So they are not really into this, um, you know, red and blue kind of politics. It's just one line in between. They have these multiple parties. If you don't like them, they have a single person party. So uh, they have a, a different kind of politics than what is in America, Jay. And they don't really understand the concept of this. Either you're a Republican or you're a Democrat. For them, they have many options in politics. You can be anything, and then at the end, they will coordinate at the uh, end of the election and form a coalition and come into coalition politics if there's no majority party. So Europe works in that way. Here it is two, two things. Either you're a Democrat or you're a Republican. And whose policies do you agree with? Suppose you, know, you have uh, sensitive issues like the abortion bill, the immigration rights. They will swing your... Uh, uh, your ideology to the other side. 
So that is very uh, difficult for the Europeans to understand yeah, this kind of politics. Uh, black and white, red and blue in America it is. <laughs> you know, when when uh, we, we saw the Ukraine invasion start, um, our reaction was, hey, this is really an important war. Um, because at the end of the day, this is going to affect, um, you know, Europe. And it's going to affect the liberal world order about one neighbor not invading his his other neighbor, um, mm. which is exactly what has happened in, in a war attrition that has gone on for two and a half years. I guess uh, my question to you is, um, it, it seems clear to me now, much more clear than, than it was then, that this election has, has import. It will affect, not a maybe, but a will affect the global order, the you know the liberal world order that has essentially existed, American hegemony, uh, since the war, and now this is going to change to the extent that it hasn't already changed. Do you agree? Yes, Jay. Absolutely, I agree. Because this hegemony has needed uh, America to stand out and to stand strong and to uh, uh, bring yourself down to uh, ally with the uh, enemy is not been the style of American politics from the beginning. It has always been to either step back or step up. It's never been step along with you. Uh, that kind of politics has never existed. That's why it's the head of NATO. It's the head of... Uh, uh, the biggest uh, funder of uh, the UN, so many forums, so many uh, leadership qualities. When you have this kind of uh, uh, intermingling at your level kind of a thing, so that doesn't work well for American politics. It has, a uh, hegemon has its duties, responsibilities, and protocol that has to be followed. <laughs> the protocol should not lack, a king should be a king, uh, you know, there has to be uh, a differentiation of duties, a competitor, a competing king and one king will not be ally they will not be allies to such an extent that they will forge out a, a different world order. It has to be a balance of power which comes into play. It has to be a decision maker in important conflicts. Russia and uh, America stand at two ends of the spectrum. While Russia is working for de-dollarization for an anti-American uh, uh, bloc, America has to get up and uh, build dynamics to have a stronger American foundation in the international world order. If you get into that bracket of Russia's maneuvers, you fall short, Jay, and you fall short of being the leader. And um, so many times uh, it, it, it has to work towards your number one position, Jay. It has to be ambition over anything else in global politics. Well, as they say, you, you are for whom you vote. And yes. the country is the country is defined by who it votes for. And if the the country allows Trump to get in back back in office, um that will be the definition of the country. And it may be sad and wrong and ultimately tragic, but that will be what we are known for. Anyway, we're, we're out of time. I only want to add this, um, you know, this one thought. People in this country do not understand that there were global implications to this election. And that's so for a lot of reasons. Um, but I think, as George Will said in a recent uh, column, um, there has not been enough attention paid to the very issues that you and I are discussing today the global implications of the election. People are more interested in, in, in um, paying a little less for gas at the pump or for eggs at the grocery store. But that's not really the issue. The issue is where does it leave the country? And we will Thank see you. soon enough. Thank you so much, Rupmati Kandakar, uh, our geopolitical strategist. Thank you for this discussion. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks to our viewers for watching. Aloha. Hello, Ajay. Thank you so much.